Welcome to the new format for Great Lakes Church online and the Great Lakes Church podcast. Services now available on demand Sundays at 9 o'clock a.m. Central. Announcements available at the beginning of each service. To skip to the talk, please refer to the timestamps in the description. Enjoy the service. And this Christmas will be a very special Christmas for you who are here. Awesome. Nobody told me you'd be getting here just yet. I'm Carson and totally not overly excited about the Christmas services that are happening here in just a few weeks. I hope you'll join us. If you need dates and times, you can go to greatlakeschurch.com slash Christmas. You can check out this graphic that's on screen and so lovely. Uh, but seriously, don't miss out. We, we know how to have a good time around here. And no guarantees I break out that bunny costume again, but maybe if you get the reference on that, you have a special place in my heart. We're ushering in Thanksgiving week here at Great Lakes Church, and I hope all of y'all eat so much turkey that it makes you sick this week. But I was reflecting a lot, and truly I owe so much of who I am and the life that I've been given to this very place, the things God has done here. I think about the best friends I made when I moved here a couple years ago. I think about how that has grown into a community of supportive people alongside me who remind me of who I really am and speak the truth of Jesus over my life. And not to mention that the woman that I'm about to marry, I met within these four walls. So I personally have a lot to be thankful for. I think all of us in general could find a lot to be grateful for. And so I would give you the challenge today when you're having a conversation with someone on your way out today, ask them what they're grateful for, share something you're grateful for. It is a good practice. Stanford says that people who express gratitude daily are generally happier people. So you can't argue with research from one of the best colleges in the nation. Well, hey, in the spirit of Christmas, we like to lead the way for the coming year with radical generosity through something called our Christmas offering. And it starts in November. It continues through the end of the year. And we're smack in the middle of exploring five initiatives that mean a lot to us. And one of the initiatives we have for the coming year is to care for the extreme poor. Not just those of us who have to resort to the dollar menu at Taco Bell because finances are a little tight, but those who literally make dollars every week, like truly a shred of what we would call income. And we believe that people all around the world deserve dignity. They deserve access to meaningful life and lives of purpose, regardless of what their financial status is. So we're doing this through partnerships with Charity Water, Habitat for Humanity, Sleep in Heavenly Peace, but most notably, a large sum of our dollars is going to complete phase two of a tech school in Honduras as part of the El Paraiso Church outreach. And they're training up the next generation of industrial sewers, computer engineers, welders, programmers, and it's gonna be so exciting to watch these leaders be raised up from young ages. We got to talk with the pastor of the church down there who's taking on this initiative, Pastor Johan. Check out what he had to say. Yeah. Welcome everybody, here we are in Honduras. This is Pastor Johan, and I want to share with you what God is doing to you, to your offerings, your support, your sponsorship for this vision that God has given us for this nation. This is what we are doing here. Our trade school is going on and we almost done with the first floor. We'll, uh, we will teach here welding skills for our youth people. We have our feeding program with 516 children right now and we are growing up. And this will be for welding shop, and this will be for industrial sewing shop. So we, uh, up there will be music, English, electricity, and computer systems. This is an amazing project. So thank you very much for each penny, each cent you have sent here to Honduras. And this is why we are working hard for this next generation. Por favor. They are who we are working for. They will be our students, they will be our teachers, they will be our senators, our mayors, and we are praying for a president for our feeding, from our feeding program. Thank you very much for supporting them. They are from different families, but they have one vision, create leaders useful to our nation, 
here in El Marañón. Thank you very much. We can't think of a better way to lead and invest in a community than to raise up those who are the future of the community. Johan said it in the video and he says all the time that they're praying that the next president of Honduras will come straight from the heart of their program. We believe that change comes when we equip people with the tools they need to evoke change. And so join us in this through our Christmas offering. Now maybe you're asking, why do you do this and how much do I have to give? Well, we do it because this is our dedicated chance to rally behind loving people here, near and far, which is the core of who we are at Great Lakes Church. And how much you wanna give is really between you and God. Anything above and beyond our throttled back operations budget in these months will go towards these outreaches in the coming years. So there's no special notes you need to make on the check. There's no need to overthink it. Just give what you feel called to give. Maybe stretch yourself a little beyond what you normally would. Or if you've never given before, this is the perfect time to get involved for the first time. We love that you've chosen to get on board with us as we move forward loving and serving people, doing it together because we are more powerful as a team. And if you're here for the first time, before I go, just know that we have a special gift for you, our way of saying thank you and expressing our gratitude to you in the form of a t-shirt that is totally free. All you have to do to claim it is grab that yellow connection card in the seat back pocket in front of you. If you're online, you can go to greatlakeschurch.com cc. If you're in person, bring that connection card to the next steps table in the lobby. And if you're online, we're gonna ship it to your doorstep. Thanks for being a part of our community and we hope you enjoy the talk. <clears throat> Take three. <laughs> Not my fault, because I only needed one. What's going on, y'all? I'm gonna let it slide that, that y'all called me a guest speaker again. But we're not gonna we're not gonna keep having the same conversation, are we? Guys in the back. Um I'm so thankful to be back uh, to share again this weekend. Uh, Y'all don't know this, but I'm going to tell it because that's what I do, uh, tell stuff I shouldn't tell everybody. Uh, Dave bestowed the greatest honor he could have bestowed upon me uh, th this weekend. He literally for the first time said to me, y'all, you can do a talk on whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> See, you, you don't know this, uh, but for a preacher to, to give a degree of freedom and just say, you know what, whatever you want to talk about, you can talk about, is a tremendous honor because typically when other people are standing up to do a talk, we don't give just the green light to do, say whatever you want to say. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so after all these years and all this time of relationship building, I finally get the green light to talk about whatever I want to talk about. Uh, so, so I'm so thankful uh, that I get to share this moment with y'all. Are y'all ready? Let's do it. Let, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, I, I want to look to Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Not only do I get the green light to preach about or talk about whatever I want to talk about, I'm going to read a whole bunch of scripture. Uh, if you know me, I typically read one or two or three passages. No, no, we, we finna read all of this. Amen? Amen? All right, let's do it. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. He then put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. 
Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Amen. Um, December 17th, 1989, something happened. An animated sitcom was aired that would go on to be America's longest running sitcom to date. And I can vividly remember being a child watching The Simpsons and feeling in that moment that I was absolutely too young to be watching The Simpsons. (laughs) And if you don't know anything about The Simpsons, uh, it's a comedy that takes place in the fictitious town of Springfield and chronicles the lives of the Simpson family. You got Homer, uh, he's a safety inspector at a nuclear plant. Uh, You got his wife Marge, who's a housewife. Their children Bart, who's earmarked as the troublemaker. Lisa, who's a genius. And Maggie, who's the baby. One of the first characters outside of this family to appear on the show was a brother by the name of Nedward Flanders Jr., a.k.a. Ned Flanders, uh, who lives next door to the Simpson family. Uh, Ned Flanders became known throughout the course of the show as the most neighborly neighbor to ever neighbor. And if you've never seen The Simpsons, uh, one thing that will stand out season over season is this guy named Ned Flanders who takes being a neighbor seriously. I mean, Ned is a devout Christian who shows charity and kindness and compassion over and over again. And when we look at the life of Ned Flanders, it is synonymous with what it means to be a good neighbor. I mean, if I could one day be half the neighbor that Ned Flanders was, my neighborhood would love me. Ned Flanders shows us, though, in a comedic and overly dramatic way, what it means to be a neighbor. And that really brings me right into the middle of the text that I read to you earlier, because this is the topic of conversation between Jesus and this religious teacher of the law. He says, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus begins to tell a story. So right off the bat, I want you to recognize that neighbors are more than the people that live in your neighborhood. Let's get that out of the way right now. Neighbors are the people that live, work, and play in the communities that we live, work, and play in. One of the amazing things about the day and time that that we live in is that as large as the world is, the world seems so much smaller than it used to be. Through, through, Through social media and technology and faster vehicles, we have access to people in ways they didn't have access to people when Jesus is writing this story or when Jesus is speaking these words. And so I want to encourage you to expand your neighborhood as you listen to this talk. As this holiday season is upon us and we're going to be spending time at home and with family and in our communities, this is really a good time to talk about what it means to be a good neighbor. Jesus uses this story to to illustrate not only who our neighbors are, but also what it looks like to be a good neighbor. Think about Ned Flanders. Good neighbors, number one, see people. Good neighbors see people. How do you see people, by the way? Because I think way too often we see people through the lenses of our own preconceived notions about the group they identify with. Say amen or ouch real quick right there. That's a good place. Thank you. We see people based on who we think they are, and we predetermine what box to put them in based on a variety of factors. Sometimes it's skin color. Sometimes it's how they're dressed. Sometimes it's if they have a certain accent. Sometimes it's the music they pull up listening to. Sometimes it's who they're with. Sometimes it's do they have piercings or or tattoos, or do they have a Make America Great Again hat on, or do they have a Black Lives Matter t-shirt on? We make assumptions and we categorize people based on our own preconceived notions. We use the information available to us when we see people to decide who they are before we actually know them. The good Samaritan, whose name we don't know, had to step over his own cultural bias and prejudice to see this man. Y'all get what I'm saying? 
Maybe you don't really understand the context of the story. You need to know there was a deep-seated rift between Jewish people and Samaritans at the time Jesus is writing this story. The, the Samaritans were viewed as half-breeds who were once part of the northern kingdom of Israel, and they believed that God chose uh, Mount Jezreel, and the Jewish folks believed that God chose Mount, Mount Zion. And so this tension built over time between these people groups, and violence was common. The Jewish people had a very low view of the Samaritan people, and the Samaritan people had a very low view of the Jewish people. So for Jesus to begin telling this story would have been absolutely scandalous. The minute he mentions a Samaritan, more than likely there's gas uh, coming from the circle, the people that are listening to him. It would have been absolutely scandalous for him to not only mention a Samaritan, but for Jesus to have the audacity to make this Samaritan the hero of the story. This Samaritan sees this wounded man and he doesn't simply see him as Jewish. Let me ask you again, how do you see people? Listen, we have to learn to look at people and see them the way that God does. And being a good neighbor is all about looking at people and seeing the value in them that God sees when he looks at them. Second thing, but being a good neighbor is to offer help. We help people. And I think too often we're really good at criticizing, but we're not so good at helping. Ooh, hey amen, ouch, that's good. Y'all know it is. It hurt, don't it? Sometimes when I'm writing this stuff, I'm like, ooh, it hurt me. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're so good at criticizing, but we're not good at helping. Like, it's so easy to point out what's wrong with somebody else. It's so easy to point out what other people did wrong. It, it is so easy for us to criticize other people. N not so easy to actually offer help. Now, let me warn you, if you get serious about helping people, it's going to cause you to be inconvenienced. In the story, there's a priest and there's a temple assistant who pass by. They see the man needs help, but they just didn't want to be inconvenienced. That They weren't willing to be inconvenienced. Maybe they just offered their thoughts and prayers. Y'all know we be posting that when stuff happens. People need help. Thoughts and prayers. Maybe they were in a rush. Maybe they were tired from work. Maybe they were ready to get home. We don't really know what their reasoning is. But, but, but what we do know is this. In order to help people, you, you have to be willing to get involved in their lives. Helping means that, that we're inconvenienced to come alongside other people. Y'all, I say this as much as I can and not get on people's nerves. The beams of the cross are vertical and horizontal. I used to give Dr. Brian Lawrence credit for that statement, but I say it more than him now. The beams of the cross are both vertical and horizontal. And what I mean by that is the gospel repairs our relationship with God the Father. It is vertical, but, but it also gives us a family. It is horizontal. And so the gospel compels us to do life with people, to get involved, to offer help, to be inconvenient. As God's people, but we are compelled to, to help other people. Good, good neighbors help people, y'all. Third thing, good neighbors love tangibly. This Samaritan man is inconvenienced and he goes out of his way for this wounded man. He, he, his concern is for the good of the other, other person. I can put Bible on it. John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you might also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I understand that, that by giving this commandment, Jesus had did something that the world hadn't seen before. He, he creates this group of people that we now know as the church. And the main identifying characteristic is one thing love. 
Look, think about it. There's all kinds of groups in the world, all kinds of people identify themselves in all kinds of ways, right? But, but, but the church is identified for our love for other people. And when Jesus says love one another, he, he qualifies it. He says love one another the way that I loved you. He, he doesn't just tell us how to do it. He, he shows us how it's actually done. And, and, and if you've been in church for a long time, then maybe you've heard this word at least tossed out there. The word is agape, right? Agape represents this radical type of love that Jesus is talking about. It is a love that is selfless. And that's the word that, that John uses here when, when he's talking about Jesus, when Jesus says love one another. It, it is the love that lives above circumstance. It is faithful commitment. And it's not about emotion, right? It is about action. It is about choice. It is choosing to love somebody else. And, and it is the very love of God. God loved us so deeply that his heart was stirred out to do something to save humanity. God's love drove him to action. And that's what love does. Love drives us to action. Love drives us to, to do something about the problem. L -l -l love compels us to step into uncomfortable places compels us to do the difficult thing, compels us to want what is best for other people and not to only focus on what is good for us. Fourth thing, show mercy. Good neighbors are merciful. Show mercy. I know everything inside of you cringed when I said show mercy because we are so wired to not be merciful. Like we're so wired to not be merciful. Listen, I get it. I mean, I struggle in my own humanity. You know, people do certain things and I so want to curse them out about it. Like I, I so want to go off in certain moments. But we're compelled to show mercy. Verses 36 and 37. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus says, yes, go and do the same thing. You, you know, I used to think that mercy was only withholding punishment. I, I used to think that, that mercy was just about like me not going off on people, not showing my anger. But honestly, at that point, I had an oversimplified view of mercy. So for me, mercy was like not hurting your feelings, even though you deserve to have your feelings hurt. It's when I walked away instead of punching you in the face, right? That's mercy. <laughs> but the more I started to read the Bible and understand mercy it is so much more than just withholding punishment. Mercy is extended to an offender in the form of forgiveness or to the suffering in the form of comfort. Mercy can actually be categorized as compassionate treatment of those who are in distress. And that's a little bit deeper, ain't it? Listen, whether the distress is caused by the guilt or penalty of sin or, or by a debilitating physical condition, mercy is there to help. Mercy is for our heart to be moved when we see other people in trouble. And I want to urge you to, to hold on to this definition of mercy. Particularly in a culture that loves to make fun of folks that are in trouble. That, that loves to parade the troubles of other people on front pages. When we're tempted to see people in trouble and say, see, that's what they get. I knew. I knew it was something about them. Mercy fuels compassion. Mercy provides light in a dark world. It, it is kindness. It, it's forward forgiveness. It's empathy. 
I'm not saying that, 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 that there's not consequences for the actions of people in their lives. Like we see things happen and we see people, you know, make certain decisions and we see the ramifications of those decisions. But that, that, that doesn't relieve us of our duty to empathize. You know, to recognize, man, I can imagine this person is in a tough spot. I I can imagine they're embarrassed and they're broken and they're hurt behind the decisions they made. I can imagine what a tough spot it is for their family. We, We empathize. We choose to not be offended. We choose to see a hurting heart behind hurtful words. We choose to see brokenness behind bad decisions. I'll close with this. Father Howard Gray, uh, uh, Georgetown University, teaches that the parable of the Good Samaritan actually provides us with a process for becoming merciful. In in a lecture to seminarians uh, several years ago, he, he explained that this parable teaches us the first lesson of compassion is to look beyond ourselves toward others. It leads us to this mentality where we we learn to suffer with people which is compassion. As we see this, as we suffer with people, it demands a response that moves us to action on behalf of others in a way that that naturally seeks to involve other people. In fact, Father Howard argues that that, that all acts of compassion have in them the grace to build networks of compassion. What that means is we, we see people And we suffer with people and we realize how difficult of a spot they're in. And then we begin to rally others so so that we can come and put our arms around this person so that we can help as a collective. The Samaritan shows this this process. Father Howard says he does four things. He sees the victim. He draws close to the victim. He allows his heart to be moved with compassion. And then he acts. And so he's moved beyond the act of seeing and feeling for the victim to actually giving up time, money, and priorities to help care for him. He begins to build this network of compassion by pulling the innkeeper in. Hey, I need you to take care of him while I'm gone. And whatever it costs, I'll pay it when I get back. This is the thing. Tragedy is often an opportunity to build community. And I pray we don't miss that. Tragedy is often an opportunity to build community. And this story reminds us that Jesus calls each of us to respond to pain, tragedy, and brokenness in very specific ways. Y'all, we have witnessed so much pain in our community over the last few years. How are we responding to that? This time of year, as we move into this holiday season, this is a difficult time for a lot of people, maybe even some of you. For so many people, tragedy and trauma is connected to the holidays. For many of us, this is going to be the first uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas without mom, without dad, without our child. For some folks, this time of year is a reminder of brokenness and loneliness. For some folks, this is going to be the first holiday season since the divorce. We need to let tragedy, brokenness, pain be this opportunity for us to build community. And as we prepare to go into this holiday season, 
I want us as the church to be focused on what it means to be a good neighbor. Y- y'all, we can all tap into our inner Ned Flanders. Amen? Let's pray together. Why don't you stand with me? Lord, help us to be good neighbors. Father, help us to, to, really, to, to really actually see people to look beyond our own bias, our own prejudices, that that we would look and see people the way that you see people. God, help us to love and to help and to show mercy and compassion to those we encounter who are in need. Father God, use us and lead us that we might be a blessing to others. God, help us to be the type of neighbors that you will be pleased with. God, as we struggle with the reality of of this parable that Jesus told God, we ask you to change our hearts. We ask you to, to lead us into helping us love tangibly. God, we can't love like this on our own. So we say, Holy Spirit, be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us. But the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can hang out with us every day at greatlakeschurch.com, the Great Lakes Church app, or on socials at Great Lakes Church. We'll see you next time.